ask all of you to maybe just introduce yourself and tell us what your, ex your expectations would be for the session. I'll start with you, Kevin. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Moravi Kevin. Uh, what did you say we introduce ourselves then? Yeah, just an introduction and your expectation for the session. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Moravi Kevin. I'm a pharmacy student uh, recently, who has recently finished his exams. Yes. Uh, what I'm expecting from the session, being the world mental health day uh i would like to uh to hear the various ideas and opinions on how to raise awareness in our society how to create uh the necessary strategies in place for to improve the access to uh mental health facilities yeah okay Hello. So majorly focusing on awareness, creation, interventions that we can use to create awareness, and two, how to improve access to mental health services in our communities. Looks yes. very logical. Then I'll give you a chance. That is Nabila. Hello, everyone. Hello. My, how are you? My, I'm fine. My name is Nabila Muruthi. I am a pharmacy yes. student yes. in my third year, and. I, I'd like to learn more about mental health in terms of its categories, how to cope, and you know, a, prof a professional point of view on it at large. Yeah. Okay. So the focus would be on the categories of mental health and how to cope with mental health challenges. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Then I'll give the next chance to. Muridi, no, Muridi is already spoken. Katila Mutuku, we are doing our introductions and maybe an expectation of what we expect for the session today. Good evening. Okay, Good evening. I'm Katile. I'm a pharmacy student that year. So I'm expecting to learn more about different categories of mental health. We know it's a broad topic, but there are those insights that people want to know about mental health, mostly for students in school. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So majorly the categories of mental health because it's a broad topic. So we need to look at the different aspects of it, which is important. Hezron, I don't know if you can speak. He's just texted that he's a little committed. Yeah, Kevin, you have something? So I want to suggest for, uh, for the audience, the people who the audience who want to know about the categories, if you won't be able to cover them today, uh, I think we are covering them in a previous session. Okay. okay. That's well. Hezron, Hezron is a little committed, is in just concluding another meeting, so he'll join it at some other point, which is okay. So, one to start us off, our charity is back. Charity, we were doing our introductions. Maybe you could introduce yourself and let us in in terms of some of the expectations that you might be having for the session we have today. Yes, Charity. Hello, Charity. Seems she's not able to respond live. So, well, we'll get to them. We'll get to the main discussion that we're looking into. Oh, okay, Hezron is back. So Hezron, you can you can speak up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good sorry, afternoon. I'm late. Yeah, I had another meeting. So uh, my name is Hezron, and uh, I'm a team player at Culture, and also the founder of Planet Wizard. 
and we are glad to be having you today uh, discussing on uh, mental health, which is a which is a big issue right now everywhere. And we welcome everyone who is going to be uh, presenting and listening. Yeah, thank you, David. Have I answered everything <laughs> that guys were talking about? Uh -huh, your expectations? Oh, yeah. So for my expectations is maybe just get a deeper understanding of mental health. Yeah, let me just say that for now. Okay. So a deeper understanding of mental health. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can I speak? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Charity. I'm, I'm a student at the University of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Nadia, pharmacy. Um, I'm glad to be here. And um, well, my expectations for this for this session is uh, to get a better understanding of uh, mental health, and also get to know how people out there are doing to help people uh, while having mental challenges or mental illness, and um, also gain insight on how I can also contribute in helping alleviate this situation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So to get a better understanding, I also have to look at what's being done to improve access to mental health services and see what yeah. you can do in that line. Uh-huh. Perfect. Thank you so much, Charity. So as you guys have just given given us some of the insight on what we'd be keen on looking into, it's important that we get started on the general overview as to why the first focus of the day would be. As you guys, I don't know if you can see the projected by now the poster that we had yes yes perfect if you can see the poster our focus is on mental health for for all greater investment and greater access and this is based on the focus today because being world mental health day there was a theme that was the running theme for the day looking at what are the shortfalls that we have and looking at those shortfalls the focus is on how to drive advocacy and improve access to mental health care services. And what has been noted is there is a limited access to mental health services because of limited investment on the same. So that would be the focus of the day, of the day, day and even any other advocacy that's going on. But as you guys have highlighted, it's very important that we acknowledge the fact that for us to act on mental health, we need to be informed to know what does it entail first. Once we are aware of what mental health is, then that is supposed to guide us in terms of knowing what we can do to make an adjustment, how we can invest in it, and what components of care are essential in improving access to mental health care services. So that's a very critical point as well. And then the other point that you mentioned is how to cope and the category. The categories will come under an awareness as well. Then how to cope is now the access to care, the kind of care that we can get. And in healthcare, the most critical bit is to acknowledge it from the point of care spans preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative healthcare services. So those are five different components. So it doesn't mean that you have to be, to get the care when you are sick, when you're not able to function optimally at a point when you're sick. And that is another critical thing that we have to acknowledge. So when we talk about access to mental healthcare services, it's access to mental healthcare services before you get sick, when you are sick, and up, upon recovery, how you cope moving forward, the palliative, the rehabilitative, and the supportive care that you need to ensure you attain positive health outcomes at the end of the day. So that is a most critical bit for us. So when you look at it from the aspect of mental health, what's mental health? Mental health is a state of well-being, and as you, it's a good, good, a good coincidence that we have most of you having a medical background, so we can at, at least say, we all know that not being sick doesn't mean you're healthy because we look at the overall wellness of an individual from the point of being emotionally, psychologically, physically, and socially well, that you can relate with people who can perform at your best and their optimum at any one given time. That is when we consider you to be healthy. So lack of a physical disease or any kind of a disease state doesn't mean you're healthy. The question is whether you are able to cope with the circumstances that you're facing in your life how you can relate with others and how whether you're productive in everything that you're doing. So if you're able to achieve that and you're able to perform at your optimum, then we would consider you having 
good health. So in terms of mental health is whether you are at the best state of mind. And some of the critical pointers that we look into when talking about mental health is, one, whether you are able to perform your functions and your responsibilities diligently. You guys have talked about being in school, mm -hmm. a couple of you. So if you're in school, are you able to attend your classes? Are you able to do your schoolwork as required? Do you relate with the people within your environment with ease and perform you, like the relationships are healthy? That is one component. So about being able to perform your tasks as is required of you without any hindrances and any challenges in the process of it, one. Two, beyond that, we look at it from a component of being able to be, are you productive? The productivity that you do. You can be doing all that because you're conforming, you're coming to class with everyone, which is okay. You are attending your class, you are doing the assignments. How productive are you in the, pro, in the conduct of your activities? And beyond being productive, are you able to contribute to the betterment of your society? There are certain things that you need to do to be supportive of others in the con context of where you live. Let's say, for example, you're in a family, you are an elderly person. Do you provide for your family? If you're able to provide for that, that's a better thing. Do you reach out to the community and guide them to be better versions of themselves? Can you mentor them at the point of optimum functionality in that you are able to meet your responsibilities and perform them productively? You contribute to the betterment of the society. And beyond that, you are good with your relationship with other people that makes it to be mentally healthy, whether that means socially, psychologically, emotionally, and even your relationship with others are at best, they are thriving, not surviving. So that is what we would look at as mental health. So if that is the focus of our discussion on mental health, then how do we link that to the different classes that guys are talking about? How do we know the categories? There are varied categories, actually. The major subdivisions look at the mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, and behavior. I know, behavior behavioral issues in mental health. So when you talk about mood, we talk about somebody getting depressed, mania, and all related, even bipolar falls under that partly. Then we have the anxieties. That will include even the phobias that are critical. Then we talked about psychotic disorders. Then for the psychotic disorders, it will touch on issues like schizophrenia, the psycho, psycho dissociative disorders that people deal with. So it deals with an impairment of your own, it's kind of psychological makeup. The brain has a difficulty for processing certain information. And even the wiring of the nerves has a disruption that might be physically initiated, or it has can result as a result of a fail, just a functional deficit. It's, it can either be functional or physical, disability or dis distraction on your brain function abilities. So that will be the psychotic components of it. Then beyond that, we have the behavior changes. The behavior can be in terms of even the feeding habits, ADH, uh, attention deficit type activity disorder. We look at it in terms of substance abuse disorders. Those are behavioral factors. So those are the different classification. And as Kevin mentioned earlier, one of the mental health talks that we hosted one of the Saturdays a while back, had covered a couple of these. And these are pointers on what we can do more and continue sharing that information. So probably by the end of the day or tomorrow, you can have access to those recordings on our YouTube channel, which would be good for everyone so that we keep learning. And in case there's anything that we need to look into, we need to share that information, then we continue the discussion on the mental health components that are very critical for all of us. Does that kind of align with what you guys had expected initially on the first part of it? You can yes. use the chat option or we can speak up as well. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. So if that aligns, that would be good for us. And we have one of our panelists who has just made it in. Ogbu, God's gifts. How are you? Hello, God's gift. He is the founder of Let's Talk Health Nigeria. Well, probably he's not able to communicate because the microphone is still off. So we'll continue. So one that is one on the looking at the mental health as a disorder itself. Then what are the, from the background, we know that one in four people suffer to have mental health problems or are predisposed to having a mental health condition at any one point in their lives. So what are the most critical challenges that we're having? And it's very important that you look at it from the angle of 
most people who are either predisposed to mental health conditions or most people who are suffering at this point in time more we know are majorly young people. And partly from research that has been done, it's noted that we have a changing epidemiological profile, that's one. Most of the diseases that people used to suffer from are not affecting people as much. That is an, as, an advance, as a result of the advancements in science because malaria will be treated with ease and all that. So those are dying. Non-communicable diseases are arising and the burden of non-communicable diseases are being are on the rise all through. So a mental health falling under one of the non-communicable diseases is still there and we need to look into it. Another thing is social determinants of health. And as a result of the arising issues in our social factors that are contributing to mental health, we look at it from unemployment is on the rise. And I can't assure you that unemployment is going to be done with, especially when you guys, most of you mentioned being pharmacy students in the country. You know, we're having issues even with the internship with employment and related. So if this isn't happening in the medical sector where there is always a need and there has been a tendency to ensure medical students and medical practitioners who graduate are taken in automatically, but this is now coming to an end. So what lies ahead of us? What do we expect to see in the coming future? And when you feel like you're not going to get a job when, and then at the same time, your education was aligned to ensuring you have a better future in the sense that you learn what to do and you can be able to do that in service of your community and earn a living doing that. Then what are you going to do with the knowledge that you have when there's no employment opportunities or there are limited employment opportunities? That's a stressor. And when you're stressed and you feel like things are not working out, you might get to experience any of the mental health challenges that we have. Early this year, that is March on 20th, we have the first case of COVID-19 being reported. There was a disruption in all our lives. And when our lives got disrupted, school work is not, school is not continuing our education. For those who are working, you're working and you're at a disposed and increased risk of being infected. That is one for the healthcare facilities. Other than that, for the general public, some lost jobs, some had to go for go their pays or some for some period or even have pay cuts that are being affected in their salaries. And when that is happening, it's not something that you pre prepared for. You are not planned to know that by the this year I'll be having half of my salary. Your bills are still there. You have to pay for them and cater for your needs as an individual and as a member of the community. So how do you cope within this? So there was anxiety that is as a start of COVID-19 because nobody knew how it's going to turn out, whether they're going to get infected and related. After that, the anxiety comes to an end, but the social implication, the social ramifications of the same come into stage in terms of lost jobs, disruption, disruption of our social circles and social influences, like the interaction that we have with people. I had a couple of friends that we used to interact. As you gave, Hezron mentioned, is part of our team as a culture. Can you guys imagine that since we've not met from February this year, and this is October 10th, so that is eight, eight or nine months that are lapsing without having met and people. We are people who work together. We are people who do the same work together. How does it work? And we are friends in the first place. So that kind of a disruption in our social circles, and we acknowledge that our social circles are very important in terms of our well-being. We perform at our best when we are people with support, supporters who understand how we do things, and they give us that assurance that there's hope for making things work out at the end. And that has been disrupted. In terms of our families, for some who went home, you were with your families, it's better if you have good relationship with your families. If you've had a strained relationship with your family members, then with COVID-19, it's going to be exacerbated in the sense that you've never been having such moments where you can talk openly about matters that are affecting you. And now you're being confined to an environment where you must relate with them because that is what has to happen. You're staying with them all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 30 or 20, 30 or 31 days in a month, and for all the period from March to October now, that now at least things are getting a little relaxed. So how do you cope with that? There are stressors, there are issues that you can't respond to, especially in an African context. This is from my perspective. As a student, most of the time when you received money, it was because you were in school and you needed upkeep in school. Now you are at home, you are at home. there are certain needs that you have, but you don't have any source of income. So you expect your parents to give you that money. But when you're home, there's no justification. They'll say they feed you, you don't pay any rent. So why do you need that money? Yes, there are things that you need. How do you get that financing to attend to your own personal needs? That's also another stressor that can happen, but most of the time we never talk about such. 
So there's so many issues that are coming into the mental health space and they have an implication in terms of how we perform. And it's not only the access to healthcare services. You know, when you have malaria, we know you're exposed to mosquitoes. You're, you're bitten by a mosquito, you have the infection, plas plasmodium. Then you have a malaria drugs, you get cured and you're good to go, you continue. This is a point that everything in your interactions in your life have an implication on whether you stay healthy or whether you don't stay healthy. So your relationship with your people, how you interact with them, ability to develop your own solutions and find a way to cope, the resilience beat, it's all diverse. And when all these are met into the final component, you're either healthy or not healthy. And it's not that we, are, we have to be at the best of all mental health status at any one point in time. We start from a point of being mentally healthy and at the extreme on the other end, we have mental illnesses where you now can end up being admitted or having to be given continuous care in terms of the curative or rehabilitative services. But in between, there are distresses. I believe every one of us at one point in time, we've been stressed, feel like things are not working out. Let's say, imagine, for example, you those in school, at towards the end of the semester, exams are there. And you, you like any pharmacology that you're studying doesn't stick to your brain. The pharmaceutical chemistry, the structures are kind of just things of their own nature. You don't understand how it's working out. And that is a stressor because you have to pass for you to move to the next level. So how do you bridge that gap? It's kind of a stressor and those are things that are contributing. So we need to look at it from the perspective of every other person who is interacting with you and every other angle of your life or facet of your life that is engaged is made to be in an environment or in a, a structure where it's enabling you to thrive. In your schools, you, are your lecturers accommodative and understanding of your learning circumstances? Is the training curriculum aligned to enable you find the functionality, the applicability of the knowledge that is being passed to you? Because if that is done, then you are the best optimal function in terms of, you can understand why you need to learn that, and it's enabling you even to comprehend it better. But if it's just a matter of bombarding you with the new knowledge and new facts, scientific facts, it might not translate to the final outcome in terms of you using that knowledge to impact on the lives of others. So that's another important, one important bit. In your own relationship with people, can we get to a point where our parenting style in terms of our parents dealing with us, or if we are lucky to be parents, as indeed some of us might be, you are able to relate with your children and with your people in your families in a way that they feel you are human. You have deficits and you have strengths in you that can both integrate one another and enable each other to thrive in an enabling and a transformative relationship with them. Do you have a nurturing relationship in your family setups? Beyond that, we look at it in terms of creating employment opportunities. Can we create employment opportunities and create an ecosystems where we are able to get meaningful jobs? And in the jobs that we do, we create values so Because once we get to that as the ultimate outcomes of ensuring every other person is healthy, that is from the preventive component. And for those who end up being sick or end up being unwell, how, what do we do and how do we support them? We need to ensure that there's access to care that is from psychosocial support, that is a counseling, psychotherapy sessions and related from all facilities where they can access care. From that, we move to the point of, in case their conditions are severe, that they need medication, are the medicines available? What are the provisions for prescription? Are they being monitored for such patients? Then once they are cured, what other thing do we integrate? Do we need to integrate a component where after they receive their care, they can get continuous follow-up other than that is the psychotherapy and the medication to a point that they can get to recover from the condition. Some of them are chronic, you never recover, but you live with them positively. So this is where we look at it from the point of people living with mental health. And then to access these services, as a society, we need to look at how to avoid stigma and discrimination that's associated with mental health, because with the stigma, most of us will not be willing to access care. That is why I won't be willing to go to malaria or hospital, because everybody seeing me getting into the facility will feel like, well, this guy is mad, this guy is crazy or something of the kind. It's not being mad, it's not just being unwell. And when I'm unwell, I need to seek the care that's supposed to help me as individuals to respond to the needs that I have. So that is the whole scope. We realize that the risk is there. And when that risk is there, 
we need to address it and look at how to make the study better. So that is on the risk. Then I have our guest now is, uh, is able to speak up. Ogbu God's gift. Hello. God's gift, how are you? Hello, Mr. David. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Oh, good afternoon from Vade. I'm fine. Oh, good afternoon, you. everyone. We are well. So it's a pleasure to have you join in. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. So we've had our discussion on the component of mental health and the risk and the burden and some of the contributing factors. Maybe you could give us your perspective from your work from Nigeria as well, before we get to the other part in terms of how do we improve investment and access to mental health and what roles can we play as individuals as well. Maybe you could start by introducing okay. yourself as well in that. All right, no problem. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Obu Chibuikin, God's Gift. I'm a fourth year medical student from Nigeria, University of Abuja. And um, I'm the co-founder and team lead of Let's Talk Health Initiative. We are primarily a mental health um, organization that focuses mainly on youth mental health, creating awareness, debunking stigma, and trying to ensure that mental health becomes a thing in Nigeria and then in Africa beyond. Because like um, Mr. David rightly said, there's this stigma, a lot of stigma attached to mental health that over here, the stigma is more towards the spiritual aspects. There's a lot of spiritual belief and um, 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 people get to tell you that if you're, mental, if you're mentally ill, it means that maybe you've been um, um, brought under a spell or maybe somebody has actually um, charmed you in quotes. So we're trying to put, out, put the word out there. We're trying to tell people that no, no, not at all. As much as there's um, maybe there may be a spiritual side to mental health issue, there's a strong, strong medical aspect to it. So we're trying to ensure that people get to seek therapy. We're trying to make sure that people get to be aware of the mental health. We're trying to ensure that people know about mental health disorders and how to actually help each other and just try to create a better society for us all. Yeah, so I think that's um, a brief introduction of myself and my work. Thank you so much. So majorly the work that has been involved in is in terms of improving advocacy and that communication around mental health. And that happens exactly. to a critical component that as we realize most of us are in our universities or either we're young people, most of us, we, can, we have a role to play in improving access to that information because we have an understanding, a slightly better understanding than the general public. So if we can take advantage of that, then we'll be moving in the right direction to improve that access to mental health care services. Good. And that's very important. So in the wake of COVID-19, there are concerns on the impact of mental health. Some of them are violated as well. Could you share more on this in how disruption has been measured even now for you who have been working in mental health? What have been the disruption in terms of the services you offer? And what has been the impact in terms of the burden of mental health? Has it been higher now or it's just okay the same standard as it was? And how are you responding to it? Okay, um, I'd like to start off um, as to how mental health has been for me personally in the society. I would say um, in the society, mental health is more, um, people's mental health has, was seen as more like a moving train. They have a train moving at high speed and nobody actually is actually caring about the speed or if the engines are okay, if the engine is okay or things like that. So we're just moving, they didn't really pay much attention around my society. And then for me personally, it was almost the same thing. Um, Let's Talk had actually started as a result of this pandemic on the 15th of May. So caring about mental health, like taking cognizance of mental health as something that took the right effects with us as a result of the pandemic. So um, as a result of the pandemic, I would say that that train, that moving train kind of like halted instantly because people were just moving without taking, taking cognizance of things they need to do to take care of themselves in terms of self-care, or in terms of doing the right thing to care for their mental health and all that. So when that train halted, I would say, people were like dumbfolded. They didn't know what to do again. They didn't know what steps to take. So you see at the early aspects of the pandemic, you find a lot of people complain that they were they're depressed, they are they're not functioning well. Because if it um, look at the right definition of mental health, you find that mental health is actually to me, actually the totality of both our physical health, our emotional health, our psychological health, 
and our general well-being. So I, when, this, when, when the train halted, we find out that people were like, okay, I'm depressed. I don't know what to do. Things are not going right anymore because, first of all, they couldn't, they couldn't interact with people. They couldn't go to work as they used to go to. For students, they couldn't study as they were studying because school was also shut down and all that. So that affected mental health. And then the yearning for improvement in mental health, the yearning for people to um, ask for a better sources of mental health and all that, prayer, up, prayer coming up and all that. And then there was a rapid increase in mental health disorder. According to some statistics um, done by, um, I think the University of um, Reading in the UK, I think there was about 20% um, increase, rapid increase in mental health issues among people of all ages, from the elderly to the young people to the children, there was a rapid increase in mental health issue. So I, I would say categoriz categorically that the yearnings of mental health um, services and then even mental health disorders actually increased as result of the pandemic and the lockdown. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the burden of mental health has increased and even the awareness about it has increased. But unfortunately, increased this is now, actually that is the you're going to align to our, they're doing for this thing. In a sense, mm -hmm. I feel from my perspective is that COVID-19 has shown us the need for mental health services. However, sure. there hasn't been an investment in that. Even though the need existed even before, now it has come to a point that we're talking about it openly. We are talking about the need to invest in mental health and improve access to care for people who are mm -hmm. having the mental health and need mental health services. So along those lines, what would be the key angles that could help us improve access to mental health in terms of, the, especially in terms of the investments? How can we ramp up action for investment in mental health? And especially in an African context that we know, the budget declaration hasn't been achieved of 15% investment in health in the first place. And when you look at the 15% investment in health by our different governments, 15% investment has not been achieved, that's one. And beyond that, when you look at all the budgets in Africa, less than 1% has ever been dedicated to, less than 1% of the less than 15%. So the health budget is already less than 15% and less than 1% of it is being dedicated to mental health. Like what are the key actions that we can do to ensure we improve that budgetary allocation? That's one. Two, and even if it's not the budgetary allocation, how can we invest more resources, more people to be engaged in terms of ensuring access to mental health care services? Um, first of all, I would say, um, Investment, investment in mental health could actually work in two phases. In as much as we're trying to get the government, because before we could even get the government and the health, um, the health policymakers to make decisions and allocate more aspects of our budgetary, uh, our, our budget to health, mental health, we on our own part needs to start investing on our personal mental health. Um, by this, I mean that, okay, like I said, the yearnings for mental health um, um, advocacy and mental health um, um, awareness increase as well of the pandemic. So this is a right call for us to, on our own, on, as a person, how do you ensure that your mental health is in place? Do you engage in self-care practices? Do you engage in things that would actually improve your mood and just help you increase your mental health? That's for that. So by the time we can actually, as individuals, collectively, engage, improve our own personal mental health, then we can now look into the government in terms of the policy making. Because before you can actually even have the right mind have the right ideology to talk to the government about increasing mental health budgeting and all that, you would already know what mental health is. You'd already know how to take care of your mental health before you can tell you, okay, government, we've done on our own part. These are things that we've done. These are steps that we've taken to care for our mental health. Now we ask, we need this redress in our mental health. You mentioned the um, just 1% out of the 15% of um, the budget in Africa, most African countries, even in Nigeria too. I think it's even less than that 1% that is being catered for mental health. So if we're able to like improve our own personal mental health, we can then move to the government angle and tell the government that, okay, government needs to work on increasing mental health. And also, we can also realize that the government is not just one person or a structure, they are individuals as well. So if we can actually encourage the individuals, personal individuals, okay, improve your mental health, advocate for more mental health, then on their own part, as the Policy makers, as the people in government, they can as well, knowing that, okay, there's actually a very good need and very good importance to care for my mental health as a person. They can now start making policies, right policies for the government, for the people, as regards mental health investment and improving mental health. Thank you. 
And then I would also talk about um, um, creating access to funding. That's actually a very um, important area too. Um, I think for the past five years, there's been a kind of like a rapid increase in foreign donors to mental health um, um, projects and mental health policies. I think um, about three months ago, there was this um, global mental health um, um, funding opportunity from um, United for Mental Health, something like that. But it's a Bill Gates, it's a Bill Gates project. And then they're actually planning to invest about 250 Canadian dollars, 250,000 Canadian dollars in mental health. So we can actually start calling, that's why we call, um, call on our, our local government, our African countries government in order to invest in mental health. We can also try to improve awareness and advocacy because by the time we put up platform, by the time we put up structures and projects for mental health, these foreign donors, these foreign organizations, they will see it and say, okay, these African um, people, they're actually taking cognizance of your mental health nowadays. Let's try to invest more. Let's try to deviate our um, funding ideas, maybe from um, gender-based violence, from um, reproductive health, more towards mental health. And then before you know, you realize that a lot of foreign organizations, foreign agencies like WHO, like UN, like UNESCO, um, UNESCO, like UNICEF and the rest, they will start looking and taking um, um, key roles in investing in mental health and mental health um, programs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So at the individual investment level, that is a very critical bit because I've realized actually from the way you talked about it, we see most of us are talking about investment in mental health, but at an individual level, we are not focusing on investing in our own mental health. How do you do your self-care activities? And what do you do for self-care in the first place to consider that you're investing in your own mental health? Because if you're not yeah, investing um, in your own mental wellness, then there's no way we can talk about improving access to mental health and investing in it from a third-person perspective. You have to invest in it by yourself first. And when you invest in it, you acknowledge the benefits of having positive mental, good mental health. So if you know the benefits of being in the good mental health status, then you can advocate for improved access to services for people who can't have access to these services. So that will be a ripple effect. And that is where now we bring in the policy perspective. And that's a critical bit. And then this aspect of that community bit that we have to all integrate ourselves and know we have a role to ensure there's access to mental health care services. And we need to enable every other person to lead the possible, like to have a good mental health. So we, our interactions with people will be aligned to that. And there's another very critical bit that you've mentioned. The international community has been investing in mental health and the investment is even more at this point in time. And when investment from the international community is as much as it is, there's one thing that now as individuals, we, we take advantage of this and ramp up advocacy and the engagements on the mental health care space, which is good as African youth because we know the challenges and what we are going through, which would be good. Then also at the same time, we align that to champion for government investment to ensure we now have more resources, not only from the international community, but even from our local perspectives of operation as young people and as mental health champions and advocates in our space. And thank you for that perspective. And now that gives me the next question that I'm going to get to you. You realize that in our context, we, some of us, we acknowledge there's a need to advocate for mental health services. There's a need to ensure there's access to mental health care services. However, in the very communities where we do exist, we have people who, when such kind of funding opportunities arise, it's a matter of opportunism. You're taking up a project because there's access to funding. And that is not, is not only going to impede access to care, but it's also making these international donors and the people who are willing to contribute to these kind of funding mechanisms, not to take it up as much. I'll always be funding, but then David on the other end is taking your money to fulfill his own agendas, not to contribute to the mental health service space. So how can we bridge that gap? Because that is something that it's kind of embezzlement of the funds, but you give a good justification for it, so they'll just buy the idea. However, it's not serving the purpose. How do we make that balance? Um, I'll say, first of all, um, mental health, because um, there's a wide discrepancy between mental health and physical. So I'll say, first of all, issues that border on mental health has to do with issues of passion. So we have to like start from the angle of passion. People have to be passionate about these things. They have to be passionate about caring for their own personal mental health. They have to be passionate about caring for the mental of their community members. Because you know, in Africa, the truth is a plain truth. There's a lot of stigmatization and a lot of shying away from mental health issues 
and people with mental health disorders. So we have to like start saying, okay, you can actually embrace things that has with mental health. You can be passionate about it. You can champion projects, not until you wait for um, the international funding agencies to provide a very big fund or something like that before you start working on it. Your own little organization, your own little environment, your own little niche, how you're ensuring that you care for the mental health of, first of all, your family, yourself, first of all, that of your family members and for the people around you. So it all boils down to the issue of passion and core interest in things that have to do with mental health. So for us to like ensure that people don't just take up projects because there's funding or because there's an opportunity to just do things, let's try to cultivate the habit of passion and interest in mental health. I think that will help us a lot. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. It needs to start be driven from the point of passion and the point of passion. need that you're solving a problem in our communities. And that is a challenge yes. that goes to our participants for the session. For you guys to commit an hour or so to be part of this discussion, it shows you have an interest in the mental health space. And because you have an interest, you can use that interest to drive meaningful action and meaningful investment in the mental health space by committing your time, by communicating that agenda and ensuring that when such kind of funding opportunities are arising, for you who is already interested in doing the work, you get that opportunity to continue the work you've been doing just even before the funding comes in. And that is very important because if at all that doesn't happen, it will be a fail for our own people. And then the other challenge that I realize is when we're looking for the money, we are chasing the money, we never offer the quality services. So at the end of the day, there's no value of the work that we are doing. Do you want to make impact with the work that you're doing or is it a matter of just getting the money and moving along? We need to get the differentiation at that particular point in time. Because if we don't, we'll have failed our own selves and failed our own communities where we, we live and where we exist with other people. So that's a very critical thing, thing as well. Then what are the key opportunities that exist for our young people now? Like majorly for, so for us here, we're young people, we interested in mental health, what kind of initiatives or activities can we drive to ensure there's improved investment and there's improved, not only investment, but access to mental health care services? I would say like for me, um, as a young person, be, like, being a mental health act, um, advocate, I would say there's actually a lot of opportunities available for people that are interested and ready to like, cultivate passion and interest in mental health. Um, for us at Let's Talk Health, like I mentioned earlier on, we actually started advocating quality for mental health on the, on the 15th of May. And within that 15th to like today, we've had a lot of um, opportunities for collaboration. We've had a lot of opportunities to stand in areas where ordinarily we won't be able to stand or we won't be able to, we won't be able to lend our voices. So due to yeah. the fact that we pick, we, we, um, pick interest in mental health, we started advocating for mental health, we could actually connect with people from all over the world. Like for me, um, we're going to have um, an expert talk. We call it an expert talk in my organization with a core mental health advocate in the US, Dr. Turner. If I wasn't a mental health um, advocate or someone interested in mental health, I wouldn't be able to reach out to him. We had literally just sent him a email, like, okay, we would like you to come and talk on the World Mental Health Day in our um, um, program. And he willingly and was ready to do it without any form of um, pain or asking for anything. So, and that's just one out of many. In terms of even funding opportunities, if you are interested and passionate about mental health, on a three to year, um, six months basis, if you check some of this um, um, opportunity, opportunity Dex website, you see some um, mini, mini grants and funds for mental health programs and all that there. And then also, um, about three months ago, in my school, my university, there was a call for research um, um, application for medical students and general students in the school. And due to the fact that we already had a project running, we could easily just rally around, write up our research paper and send it down. And then it was approved. And when we got our research work up, when it wasn't approved just because it was just a research from the student, and it, we are given, it was approved with, um, I, I would say with um, um, very good enthusiasm because the lecturers, the um, research mentors and all, they were really, really interested in the fact that we as young people, we as medical students, we took it upon ourselves to start up projects and platforms that would encourage both young people's mental health and even people of all ages. So um, generally, if people are interested, if they show interest in advocating for mental health and they are really, really, really serious about it, there are lots of opportunities to look out for and they are actually very much easy to grab. Okay. That's a very insightful uh, contribution because the opportunities that exist, the areas of engagement, the things that you can do from just participating in discussions, being part of initiative health communication, advocacy groups, awareness creation, 
And once you're doing that work, there are more opportunities and more engagements and there are more people coming into your space mm -hmm. who are going to open you up to different platforms and different opportunities. And these are the key things that are giving you the chance to continue the work that you're doing. As you've mentioned, aspect of now getting research grants, you get partnership with other organizations to contribute in their activities. And that is a growth potential because as young people want some of the things that you talked about in terms of contribution to mental health, not having a meaningful engagement in your life. What are you doing with your life and your time? If you in such kind of spaces and you get to engage with people, you are doing something that you're passionate about and you're doing something that is giving you value in terms of, let's say, even the grants that you're getting. At least you can cater for some of your bills in the process of doing the work and you see the impact of the work that you're doing. And that is very sure. important. And the last sure. bit that you mentioned was a very eye-opening aspect of it. You do something and when you're doing it, opportunities will arise and they'll find you prepared. True, quite true. in the sense that not so often do we get to that space. It's not something that we do as often as we can to start doing the work without seeing where we are heading with it, but you're passionate about it. Take advantage of your passion, do the work, and when an opportunity arises in that line, you already get something that you can pursue and move on with. And that is something that I believe as young people, as medical students and pharmacy students that you're part of this discussion, these are some discussion, some pointers that we need to pick up do something in the process and when opportunities arise you get to take advantage of them and when you do you'll be opening up more opportunities for other people who might not have access to those opportunities without you taking the lead because when we keep waiting they might never happen and when they don't happen it's a loss for everyone but if you take action at start and open an opportunity for other people then it will be a win for everyone because you're setting the space and getting things moving other people will join you in that process and it's a win for everyone. So that's a very critical bit and that is something that I realized we need to take it up as young people, as individuals in our communities because we know what needs to be done. How about we start doing it and we take advantage of upcoming opportunities? That would be a win. Then after uh, that being, that's having that said, I know you guys in Nigeria having some kind of skirmishes. How does that affect you? How does it have the, how does it contribute to your mental health? And what are you doing to ensure some of these issues are sorted? So, come again, sorry. Yeah, I'm saying we, we talked about different contributing factors to mental health. And as of now, I know in Nigeria, you have a challenge, the issue of police brutality and related, and even some of your parliamentarians were on the streets. And most of the people who are affected are young people, even the artists, the musicians on the streets and everything. How does how, how do you as young people engage with such kind of programs and ensure they don't have a much of impact on the young people? And how do you influence policy when the government bodies that are responsible for ensuring the well-being of the citizens are not happening as much? That's just on the sides of everything in terms of the mental health and being it's a current issue that's affecting you guys in your country. I um I totally understand what you're saying. Um, first of all, in terms of the br police brutality and the whole SARS issue, it's actually a very serious menace in the country because um, young people are actually on the forefront. Young people are the ones dying. Young people are the ones being traumatized by all of this. So we, on our own part, we're trying to ensure, like this morning, we actually had to put out a disclaimer and a public notice to our community members, the less talk of community members. Are. Despite the fact all this is going, try as much as possible not to get angry to the point of disrupting your mental health. Try as much as possible to be calm, even if you're going to go out and protest, which is totally fine because these things are things that ordinarily should get you angry and pissed off both with both the government and with the um, police officers. But despite the fact you're going to go out and protest and all that, try not to get it to affect your mental health. And then in terms of the public, in terms of the government, in terms of the policymakers, we most times engage in, um, um, personally, we engage in um, conversations and tweet chats, and then we also tag these um, police officers, police um, ingestions that, okay, see what is going on in the country, see what, how this is affecting youth mental health and youth progress and youth activism. 
what are you going to do about it? Just about three days ago, before the protest started, a particular celebrity, I don't know if you know him, Nera Mali, was actually going to go out and protest. But at some point, I think the, um, the IGP, the Inspector of General Police of Nigeria, called him, and they had to like do um, an IG live. And he basically spoke about the issues that border on police, um, um, airing police, but he basically visually fo focused on the fact that not all police are bad cops, or not all of them are bad cops. They are some airing police, and they are going to put up measures to ensure that the police that goes, the um, cops that act out of hand, will be brought to justice and all that. But um, in as much as they are going to talk and all that, that might not generally be the only solution to the problem. So people are actually meant to like go out there, put it out, yet uh, make sure their voices are heard, talk about things that affect them. And then we also see this um, police brutality issue generally as something that will actually open more room for more youth engagement in Nigeria policy making and policy policy because a lot of things are actually going wrong. A lot of things are wrong already in the country. A lot of issues are going on in the country that are not right, that are not favoring the youth and all that. So we are looking at, okay, not just talking about the police brutality and all that, bringing other issues, even bringing issues that put on youth mental health. Um, yeah. Just recently, I was talking to somebody in the Ministry of Health, was glad that doctor, and he was like, him understand that in Nigerian policy space, um, there's a care for adult mental health, there's a care for ch um, child mental health, but there's not really a program, there's not been, there's actually not been any program that focuses on youth and adolescent mental health. And for the past two, three years, governments, uh, um, for the past two, three years rather, governments have been coming in and out, ministries have been, minister, ministers have been coming in and out, but they've not really implemented any policy that is going to focus on youth and adolescent mental health. So, this um, discussion, this protest, this um, improve, increased activism is actually creating more um, room for young people to come out, come out and talk about things that bother them. So in all, generally, that's why the fact that it's actually taking a toll on our mental health, we are on one part advising that, okay, try to take care of yourself, try to engage in self-care activities, try not to get to, ensure that you don't get too traumatized by this. But on the other part, for the government angle, we are actually very much um, of an encouragement to the youth and we are trying to say, okay, Hey, government, see what's happening. Aside the fact that it's police brutality, there are other issues affecting us. And this is where we come to start asking for redress and reform, reforming our society. So I think that's it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So these are the issues that are affecting us as a society. And we have to acknowledge these are matters that we need to respond to. And that's a very important because I have a friend from your country who we've been having discussions around the whole SARS issue and related. And these are highlight because they're getting attention. And when they do, we have to link them with challenges that are existing in our society other than the SARS issue. The police brutality is there as a component of it. But what are the ramifications? What are the consequences of such kind of actions? If we can align them all together and see how we can respond, that would give us a concerted action in terms of improving access to mental health and ensuring we have healthy, prosperous society, which are socially sustainable in a way. And it's important you look at it from the perspective of, look at it, if the police can assault individuals, members of the public, what happens to the people who are living in the prisons? And how is that impact to them? How can we make measures to ensure that such people are taken care of? So it's a matter of identifying one thing and linking it with every other thing. I think that would be the systemic approach to issues, systems thinking, systems innovation. You have an idea of one thing that is affecting other components and integrate them because we live in an integrated society and we can't approach one matter exclusive of others that are existing within the same place. And that's a very important bit. So once we have that, I'll get back to you guys, the participants in the meeting room, so that you could share some of the comments, questions that you have before we get to the end of the session. Any questions? Hello. Yes, Hedron. Yeah, so I have a question. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the insightful uh, discussion, Ogbu and David. So my question is concerning uh, the rise in uh, digital apps uh, that have been claiming that they boost mood and help in overcoming addiction and such stuff. So w what are your comments about uh, these apps? Do you think they really work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. What do you have a response to that? Um, I would say, first of all, honestly, I've not really um, come across any of this app, actually. But I would say, um, personally, 
you should first of all um, find things. That's where the aspect of self-care come in. You, um, personal self-care talks about you finding out things that actually boost your own personal mood, irrespective of the mood of others, because we all have different things that can boost our mood. For me personally, anytime I feel down, things, things that boost my mood, either I play my favorite music, my own personal favorite music, or I take, I just get to um, do, maybe get um, my favorite food to eat. Those are two things that I actually find has a way of boosting my own personal mood. So in terms of boosting your mood, I think you should first of all look into finding out things that are specific to you as an individual that can boost your mood. And then as for the apps, you could do more research about it. If practical, you could be very practical with it. You ask yourself, is this thing actually boosting my mood? If it's not boosting my mood, then there's actually no need to do it. Just like Instagram and Facebook. Some people, when they go up on Instagram and see pictures of people, happy people and all that, they kind of like feel elated and boosted, mood is boosted. But some people, when they go up on Instagram and see pictures, they kind of feel intimidated, they get, um, anxiety and all that because they feel like people's other people's lives are better than yours so it's just mm. a personal thing if it's not boosting your mood there's no need to continue using it but if it's boosting your mood and you know it's actually working for you practically you can engage in it thank you for but we are different and i know there are a number of applications that are related in line with mental health most people are adopting that aspect which is okay i don't have an issue against it but what we have to acknowledge is our problems might not be all solved by technology. Some of us, our relations with individuals, our approach to life can make us get better from the circumstance that we're dealing with compared to adopting technology as the solution. I'm not saying that these technological solutions are not helping. For some, they do help. For some, they don't. And it's the same way. I have a friend who talks about TikTok. For them, they go dance and see how the different features are playing out, and they feel like they get excited about the whole experience. They feel happy. It's working for them. There are people who feel the same way you've talked about Instagram. When you go to the application and you find other people displaying different things, it's affecting you at a person. You feel like you're a failure in life, and nobody wants to be a failure. So how does it help you? The coping mechanisms have to play out. And then the aspect is in terms of, for me, it would be like, Different applications have different functionalities and different features with different benefits for different individuals. So some, some will work for you, some will not work for you, but the basic component is what can help us all get the quality of care that we need? And how many people can we reach out with such applications, such functionalities? For those who can access them, well and good. For some who can't, we need to find alternative measures that are enabling them. And that is where now the individuality comes into place, you know, what are the components of self-care for me at a personal level? What do I do to get well? And how do I thrive in my own personal space? As Obus talked about food and your music, there's your favorite food. Can you have that meal? You have some kind of a song that makes you believe in a better future, in better humanity and everything good coming around you. Listen to it. It will make you feel better and it makes you get, down, get better from the kind of depressed mood or something that you have going on in your life. And that is a win for you. So that is what I would take as well. Hazel, and I hope we've responded to you comprehensively. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other person then, who might have a question or comment? Then I think yes, also, yeah. there's also the aspect of uh, positive thinking and negative thinking. I, I really think it influences a lot. For, for example, if a person has negative thoughts all the time or yeah. is surrounded by people who think negatively, I think it really affects, uh, in the long run, it affects their mental health because you might find that they, they end up in, like, failing in a lot of things. Mm. Yeah, because, yeah. The negative, the negative environment, that's, that's definitely one of the contributing factors. Yeah, people always see the negatives and the bad things in life. And it plays yeah. a role. You have I, I'd like to comment. A, yeah, I have to, I'd like to yeah. comment a bit on that. Um, this that's the aspect where positive mental health come in. Um, you know, mental health is not just um, um, it's holistic. Actually, I'll, 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 let me just get to that. Mental health is holistic. There's the aspect of people actually incorporating negative mental health, which talks about the negative thinking and all that, and then the positive mental health part, which talks about self and affirmation talking about things that can help you boost your mood and all that. So I would like us to, as individuals, get to tailor our, our mental health towards the aspect of positive mental health. Um, for us at um, Let's Talk Health, there's this um, um, 
program we do. We call it Pieces in Seven. What we do is that in a week, we try to like focus on um, self affirmation, affirmation quotes and activities that can boost your mood, and it just encourage you to have a positive mental health as you go by. We put up one on on a Sunday, on a Monday. It's just it's like a routine. It goes with you from the starting of the week to the end of the week. So with that, subconsciously, as you read up the quotes, as you engage in the activities, you will find out that you are engaging in things that will just naturally, naturally help to boost your mental health and boost your mood generally. Yeah. yeah. You you can whatever it is that you take in is what will influence how you respond to your environment. The positive aspect, mm -hmm. positive thoughts, positive mentality, positive approach to life. And that positivity will reflect in your life. But on the same note, there's something that I wanted to add on that. As individuals, when we are negative, it not only affects us, it affects the people, even those who are around us. So the question is whether you're going to let it be an impact on others negatively, or you can create an environment where you see the positive about things, you see the hope of a better future that you can share with others to make them see the positivity and commit to getting to that positive outcomes in the end. Because if we can get to that point, it will be a win for me and everyone and everybody in the study. So the negative component plays out, but you at a personal level, you can take care of yourself. Get the kind of self-satisfaction, the self-influence, self-motivation from within first. Beyond that, create an environment that you can be the source of positivity in other people you interact with. If you can make them smile, please do. If you can make them enjoy the moment they're enjoying, perfect. We can do that as individuals and make things better for everyone. Any other person? A comment, a question, a concern? Seems there's none. So I'll open the floor to all of us. Before we, continue, before we conclude the session, because we have like eight more minutes, one thing we have, there's a call to action for every one of us. We're talking about investment for mental health. So you, everyone should give us a, their call to action. And as you think of that, I'll start from the point of uh, each and everyone telling us what they do for their self-care. What is your self-care plan at a personal level? So I'll start with Nabila. I hope that's fine with you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so personally, when I'm feeling down and how I make myself feel better, I usually write about how I feel. So I journal and it's a way to express myself and, you know, get yeah. to realize what I need to work on and what I need to improve on. And afterwards, I do some things that I, I deem productive, such as reading a novel, um, working out, meditating, or at least, you know, uh, doing some cleaning around the house. So it helps to lighten my mood, yeah. Okay. You journal and you get product. Yeah, the, it doesn't matter if it's a small thing, but as long as it's something, uh, uh, um, sorry, as long as it's something other than just lying in bed, yeah. Derek? Hello? Yes, as for me, yes, I would say, I would say that uh, for me, how I care about my mental health is I like to feel productive. I like to feel uh, responsible. So I keep myself busy uh, with a lot of work. And then also I, yeah. Oh, it's okay. And now you're back. I was losing you at some point. Okay, okay. So I like to feel productive and responsible and I like to look back at the things that I have achieved and remind myself of who I am. And also working out has been very helpful in that uh, area. So yeah, uh, reminding myself of who I am, being responsible, knowing that the people that depend on me makes me alleviate my, my makes me my, hand to help, my mental health better. Okay. Perfect. In a way, it's kind of reflection and celebrating the wins that you've achieved. Yes, yes, yes. And, and also knowing that the future is something that is not very concrete and it, and it can change in one way or another. So you just try to live in the present and look back uh, at what you have achieved. Perfect. 
Yeah. Actually, that's a very critical bit because the most of the times we find we are we are stuck somewhere because we keep seeing our all the failures that we've had rather than seeing the positives and the wins that we've made in through the life that we've lived. So if we can yeah. see the positives and the advantage the advances that we've made, then life is better and we get better at it every single day. And yeah. you be pro- you feel like you're productive, you reflect on that, and it makes you get better. So that's a good yeah. thing. And we need to adopt such kind of approaches as well. Katile Mutuku. Katile Mutuku. I doubt she's here. Hezron. Yeah, so what I'd say that works for me most of the time is... Yes, Hezron. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, so uh, I was saying uh, what usually works for me most of the time is, so of course, apart from uh, talking to people, um, engaging in different activities at least helps you uh, stay, stay away from some thoughts. Uh, like the way Nabila and Derek have said that most of the time they engage themselves into something. I think that's like among the best ways that someone can keep off from a lot of negative thoughts and all that. So just staying productive and just keeping busy doing something, at least it will help you stay away from different thoughts. Awesome getting productive and engaging yourself in things that help you get yeah. better at what you do, which is awesome. Well, we were to go to Fatuma and she's just left. Oh, she's here. Fatuma has left. Katile, Mtoku. Hello. So it looks like she's off. Ogbu. God's gifts. We are back on you now. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, I think I mentioned before, my basic um, self-care technique is just to listen to my favorite music. Um, yeah, I my favorite artist, J. Cole. I don't know if you guys know him. I listen to most of J. Cole's music. And then I eat my favorite meal, a Nigerian meal called Semo and Vegetable Soup. So whenever I'm down, whenever I feel down, whenever things are not working fine, I just either take on either of those and I'm good. I feel really, really good. So it could be as basic as that. Yeah. <laughs> good music and food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> music good. is also a therapy by itself. <laughs> yeah, music therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. But the, good, the goodness about it is at least all of us have something that we do that makes us cope with the not so good moments in our lives. And there's an assurance that, well, for life, it's not going to be easy all through. It's never going to be smooth, but you can make the best of every moment. So at least we know how to cope with the not so good. And for the good ones, definitely we know how to make ad- take advantage of them and celebrate them. So let's do that as much as we can. And most importantly for this World Mental Health Day, we need to keep engaging. We need to keep talking about mental health, creating awareness, reach out to people within your networks, make them know there's so much still to be done and they can contribute to it. It's not a matter of waiting for you to, sell, you to get a job or work with some organization. That's when you focus on improving your mental health. You can do it from the comfort of your phone by just typing a text message somewhere, communicating something. And that communication will make someone see the positivity that exists and that's a win for everyone. And that's a very critical thing that we can all do. Well, personally, self-care, I sleep, and I do the things that I feel like I'm, pro- I'm good at. I love reading, so when I feel like things are not working out, I'll focus on reading. And it makes me forget about any other thing that I was thinking of at that point in time and see the life from the perspective of the writer whose book I'm reading. And that's a win for me. So thank you so much, everyone, who has joined the discussion. We're looking at engaging and having more of such discussions moving forward, and we'll keep communicating. And I pass our apologies from our two other panelists who are to join in. 
Harriet Musimbi, they had a power disconnection issue. Actually, their transformer got to blow off, blew off yesterday in the evening. So that has been an issue. Wilson Kazuba from Uganda was to join in as well. Had a challenge because he was invited to a, a, a physical function in their country when they were there celebrating World Mental Health Day. So that kind of disrupted the whole schedule from their end. And I hope in the next session that we'll be hosting, they'll be able to join in and we'll get their perspectives on how we can contribute to improving investment in mental health and improving access to mental health care services. Asante Sana, and I hope to be engaged more with you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. David. Thank you. Thank you.